Since the dawn of time, the fountain of youth has been humanity's most elusive dream. Today, thanks to breakthroughs in science and technology, the dream is edging closer to reality. What awaits us on the other side, not just longer lives, but a profound reimagining of society, health, and human potential. My name is Hans Kirsted. I'm the chairman of Immunus. We are a company that addresses longevity through immunological modulation. The longevity sector is the largest sector in healthcare. The tools of immune system modulation and the tools of artificial intelligence are present now in order to grapple with this insane complexity that we have in the immune system. I've gotten better with age, and those people around me have gotten a lot better with age. It's more fun. We're smarter. We have better social skills. Physically, we're more adept. Think of yourself with an extra 50 years of experience and life and capabilities. The time is now. There's a concept called longevity escape velocity that I love, and it's the notion that today, for every year that you're alive, science is extending your life for about a third of a year. There's going to be a point in the future that for every year you're alive, science is extending your life for more than a year and that's called longevity escape velocity. So the question is, when might we have that? If you're in reasonable health and expect to be able to live an extra 20 years, can you keep yourself in great health to intercept those breakthroughs coming our way that might actually give you this longevity escape velocity? Modern tools are rewriting the very blueprints of our being, from DNA editing to advanced AI diagnostics and regenerative medicine. This is just the beginning. Our ancestors searched for the fountain of youth in myth and legend. Today, we uncover it with science and innovation. Is age a factor? To a certain degree, it is. You're not going to be able to do the things you did at 20 or 30 years old. That, that's just a given. I think the most important thing for me is spending my days as healthy as possible. If I can stay one step ahead of the reaper, I'm going to do it. It's this decade that we have the tools, both from a data and computational standpoint, but also a biology standpoint. It's also during this decade that we're seeing a massive amount of capital being invested. It used to be that only the largest institutions and governments could actually do things like sequence a genome. You know, it was $3 billion for the first genome. Now it's 200 bucks in seven hours. And all of these things are giving us the tools by which entrepreneurs can change reality. After leaving Wired Magazine, where I began thinking about science and nutrition and human health. When I went to conferences with leading edge developers of scientific solutions and technological solutions, they reminded me of the same kind of people with the same kind of energy and the same kind of opportunities in front of them as the original digital revolutionaries. The deeper I looked, the more similarities I saw between the digital revolution and what I call the neobiological revolution. The neobiological revolution is new biology. So what are the new tools that allow us to think about and understand and manipulate biology in new ways? Why is that a revolution? Because it's upending not just how we do science and how we do medicine, but it's upending how we think about food, how we think about our health, and how we think about our possibilities for engineering our own health. Longevity and health span is in the zeitgeist. Uh, there's some pretty exciting science. Uh, so it's an amazing time now to encourage smart science, startups, academics, and individuals to get involved in research to show and prove out that some of these modalities will work. I've always been more interested in sort of the health span side than longevity. I think most of us want to be 120 and feel 60, or 90 and feel 40. It's more about how these technologies come together and converge, particularly when they're fast moving, sometimes exponential technologies from personal genomics to wearables to big data to AI to nanotech and synthetic biology. I chair a program called NextMed Health, where we look at bringing folks together from all these different fields and helping them cross-fertilize. And it's when you mash up that the interesting things happen and the art of the possible can shift. Because, you know, healthcare is often very incremental. It could be a little bit more exponential, and it, it takes folks in healthcare and beyond to understand the pace of change and the ability to solve problems in new ways using some of these new, pretty magical forms of technologies. The time is now. The longevity revolution is not just about adding years to your life but adding life to our years. It's a vision where we live healthier, fuller, and richer lives. And more than any previous revolution, it's one where humans sit at the very heart of it. Staying healthy is a way to stay out of the doctor's office. 
As we get older, you want to have the best quality of life per day that you can. We live in such an interesting time where the idea that we could live to 80 or 90 is not uncommon, but what is our condition? So when you ask people, hey, want to live to 100? Most people think not. I think we now have the tools to make the 80s and 90s and 100s to be much, much better for people. Now, the digital revolution transformed our external world. It transformed the way we do business. It transformed the financial markets. It transformed our educational system. It transformed our civic society. The neobiological revolution is about transforming ourselves. The future is one where we start to understand really what's going on inside our bodies. Uh, artificial intelligence is gonna be able to take all of this data and be able to make sense of it and give you continuous recommendation. In the biotech world, gene editing is extraordinary. Breakthroughs we're seeing in CRISPR and gene therapies, being able to actually deliver new genes to different parts of your body. And then there's a whole field called epigenetic reprogramming. So you have the same DNA when you're born, when you're 20, when you're 50, when you're 100. If you've got the same DNA, why do you look different? Well, it's not what genes you have. It's what genes are on and what genes are off. And if you can reprogram your epigenetics, imagine being able to turn back the hands of time to get you back to a younger, more vibrant age. The difference between the digital revolution and the neobiological revolution is literally a question of life and death. In the early days of the internet, I, along with everybody in the tech industry, felt the same way, which was whatever is good for the internet is good for humanity. So just don't come in and try and regulate it and don't tax it and don't mess with it. Don't try and guide it because it is going to emerge and we need to see what emerges and let that happen. We need to be more thoughtful with this one and we need to engage the public much earlier. When you start interfering with the delicate balance of our ecology, people need to be aware of what's going on. We also need to be mindful about, you know, health equity. We don't want a Gattaca world where the only haves have genetically modified children that live longer and others don't. So we need to be making sure that we keep up with the ethics and policy and regulatory to enable some of these tools while having some smart guardrails on the accelerations that are possible. But the digital revolution unleashed this sort of nowness, this sort of everything is right this second, what's the latest, newest, whatever, and whatever came before is irrelevant because technology is changing everything so quickly and that's history. And that's a problem because we need history to understand how has this been attempted before, what were the potholes and what were the ethical considerations that we could have made a different choice and turned things differently. In this changing world, we're forced to rethink our place in it. How will we work? learn, and connect? What roles will our elders have, and how will our pursuit of purpose evolve when time stretches out before us? The time to explore these questions is now. We've seen in the Blue Zones projects where they look at populations that live long, healthy, active lives, it have often is the case that older populations are valued and are, are integrated into society and have a sense of purpose that changes when they're a grandparent or great-grandparent. I just think this is the most exciting time ever to be alive. We're on the verge of becoming a multiplanetary species. We're on the verge of beginning to understand the physics of the universe at a level and depth like never before. So I'm driven by that passion and being able to explore these futures. I absolutely want to dance at my great-granddaughter's wedding. As long as I have my health and my mind, I'm loving this. So if I could be 100, 110, 120, and still engaged, curious, and being able to enjoy life, I'd certainly want to have that opportunity, and for my children, friends, and family, and communities as well. Um, lifespan is one thing. Yes, I am going to live to 150 years old, but I want to live well. I want to be virile. I want to be competent. I want to be smart. And it's more important to me that the days I have on this beautiful earth are full of brilliance and capability and physical prowess. The longevity revolution has arrived, and it's inviting us to reimagine the possibilities of life itself. The time is now.